Let's get started. Paula, over to you. Thanks. Just to check on the on the housekeeping topic of questions, I'm going to be sharing my screen, so I probably won't be able to see questions as I go. But once I get to the end, then uh, I'll be happy to answer questions, like you said, or I'll be hanging out in the Platform Engineering Slack channel so people can ask me there. But I'll probably just plow straight through because uh, I might not be able to see them as I go. Exactly. Okay. And uh, I don't like to interrupt you, you know, during uh, your presentation. So let's keep the questions, you know, like till then uh, for all the attendees, please, um, you know, ask the question uh, during the session because you can forget otherwise <laughs> and uh, as many questions uh, as you want, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to moderate the Q&A section after uh, with you. So it's easier uh, and um, other than that let's get started okie dokie then let me see if i can just share my screen hopefully you can see a lovely screen with some arrows can you see that <laughs> you do perfect okay so uh thank you for having me i am really excited to be here uh presenting this evening or it's evening time for me um for anyone that's seen me speaking before, maybe at PlatformCon, maybe in webinars, maybe at other conferences, you'll know that I generally have quite a lot to say about platforms. But today I want to get back to basics and just try and explain why I am a strong believer in platform as a product. So I'm going to be talking today just about, I'll do a really fast introduction, and then I'm going to talk about the ins, so I described this as the ins and outs of platform as a product. The ins are really some of the internal questions that you might be dealing with, such as what's a platform and why do we need a platform? Why do we need a platform team? Who should be in that team? Those kind of questions. The outs are more kind of the external challenges that you as a platform team might be facing, such as who are you building the platform for? How do you work with those people that are not in your team? And how do you make sure that the platform is being used and being adopted? And what I really want to explore, the, the kind of the meat of the question is really, can we bring these ins and outs together using platform as a product ideas? And then at the end, there'll be some time for some questions as we just talked about and hopefully some good discussion. So let's start with a brief introduction. My name is Paula Kennedy. I'm co-founder and chief operating officer of a company called Sintasso. We make a framework called Kratix. It's an open source framework, which aims to make life just a little bit easier for platform engineers who are trying to compose a platform to meet developer needs. It's open source framework. You can take a look at the code. Uh, we also have a workshop that's available that you can walk through. For me, I've been working in tech for... Uh, quite a long time, more than 20 years. Uh, I started off in software as a service and then have spent probably the last 10 years more on the platform focus. So working at Pivotal and then more recently VMware, uh, working with customers who are running large internal platforms and then founding Sintasso uh, about 18 months ago. So that's a bit about me. Let's get into the talk itself. Let's start with the ins or kind of the, the internal challenges. So what do I actually mean by this? Well, since you're here listening to a platform engineering webinar, you've probably heard some of these questions, or you might be curious about the answers. You might have addressed some of these answers, or you might have answered all of these questions. But some of the questions I want to talk about, what is a platform and why do I need one? Who should be in the platform team and where should they start? So whether you've got answers to these already, whether you've already figured all these things out, I'm just gonna set out some thoughts I have based on my experience just to level set for some context. So what's a platform and why do I need one? Platform is one of those words that gets used a lot and it has different meanings for different people. This is my kind of go-to definition. Uh, it's from Evan Botcher from 2018. And he describes a platform as being a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support arranged as a compelling internal product. Autonomous delivery teams can make use of the platform to deliver product features at a higher pace with reduced coordination. So quite a lot of words there. 
There's a couple of key things to note from this definition. The first one, it doesn't mention any specific technology. The main feature it's talking about is having a self-service interface so that people can use the platform. Now at Sintasso, we're big fans of Kubernetes, a uh, great place to build platforms, but a platform doesn't have to be complicated. A platform can really just be something very simple that teams can self-service their way through into being able to deliver software. The second thing to note from this definition is it mentions teams, plural, using the platform. So we can understand from this that if you're a small organization with only one or two teams, you might not yet need an internal platform product. It's more likely something that you need as you grow in size and you've got multiple teams all trying to deliver value. And as for the why you need a platform, Evan's definition mentions that teams can deliver features faster with reduced coordination. So to dig into this just a bit more, we have to make reference to team topologies. Now, anyone who's not read this book, I would strongly recommend it. This is a photograph of my copy of it. Uh, it's a really fantastic book and it dives deeply into how to organize teams to achieve that, that higher pace of flow across the business, how to deliver value fast across the business. Now, I'm not going to go into much detail because it's a whole book and it's really worth reading. You can also find talks from the authors. I know that Manuel spoke at PlatformCon and both Matthew and Manuel have given lots of talks kind of from their book. But I just want to briefly mention the team types that Team Topologies suggests. So you can see that they advocate for having a platform team that manages the internal platform concerns. And that team, along with additional teams such as an enabling team and subsystem teams, they're there to support the stream aligned teams or application teams, you might call them, to drive that fast flow of value. So hopefully you're with me so far that when your organization gets to a certain size and you've got probably more than one stream aligned team or application team, and you're trying to focus on getting features delivered fast out to your customers, then you need a platform and you therefore need a platform team. So who should be in that platform team? One question I've heard a lot is, if we have a platform team, does that mean we're going back to having dev and ops separated? To which I have a strong answer of no. When I think about who should be in the platform team, I like to think of the, I like to play around with the definition from Google about SRE. They talked about SRE is what happens when software engineers design operations. And I like to think of platform engineering as being what happens when you scale DevOps. I'm not quite sure <laughs> if that's a hot take or not, but I put a little flame on there just in case. But really, it's not, it's not going back to a world of having applications doing dev and platform team doing ops and kind of separating it. That's not really what platform engineering is all about. We saw DevOps movement coming along to try to solve that sort of silo of DevOps. But what we've seen as DevOps has progressed and has as kind of uh, microservices have come in and as teams have scaled, we've seen issues where teams are trying to do app and platform concerns and dev and ops, which is just a high amount of cognitive load for one thing. And also leads to lots of duplication and waste if you've got multiple teams in your organization all trying to do these things. So it's not really that. So when I say that platform engineering is kind of DevOps at scale, what I'm really talking about is you've got your autonomous application teams doing dev and ops of their products. So they are building and running, but they're utilizing the platform to be able to manage their products. And the platform team is also doing dev and ops. They need to be able to think about building and running the platform. So when you're thinking about who should be in the platform team, it's really worth considering that the, the function of the platform team isn't just operations. It's really about building and running the platform to be able to meet the needs of the application teams. And that leads us to the next question of where to start. Now, the starting point is 
once you've understood that you need a platform and you've got some folks for your platform team, your starting point is actually going to be very context specific, right? What have you already got in place? What are the gaps that you've currently got? What are the skills that your team currently has? Do you have defined engineering practices within your organization? Are you doing agile? Are you doing extreme programming? Are you starting from scratch, starting small, or maybe you're already wrangling some complicated monster and you need to trim it back? Your context of where you start, like I say, will be very specific to you. But one thing to really avoid, which I've come across time and time again, is this people called about the, the field of dreams kind of process where you assume that if you build it, they will come. The thing you might want to consider is exactly who they are. If you build your platform, who are the people who would be using it? Which leads us nicely to part two, the kind of the outs or the external questions. So hopefully when you're building your platform, you're not building it in isolation. You're not building a platform just for yourselves to use. You're building a platform so that external people can use it. So then you have some external questions that you need to address. Some of the things you might need to be thinking about. Who's going to use the platform? How do we know if this platform is meeting their needs? And how do we even get people to use it? So let's start with the first one. Who's going to use the platform? If we refer back to the Evan Botcher definition, he mentioned autonomous delivery teams. In Team Topology's book, they, they talk about stream aligned teams. You might internally refer to folks using your platform as application teams or product teams. But if you're the team that is concerned with building the platform, a good starting point is to understand, ask yourself, and then try to understand who are the users of your platform. Maybe identify some actual people that you can go and talk to and understand and empathize with. Once you've identified some real platform users, you might want to consider how are you going to know if the platform is actually working for them? If you're working from a backlog of work, or maybe you have a, a ticket system where requests come in, do you actually know if the work that you're tasked with doing is going to help and how it's going to help? Do you have a process in place for getting feedback? Do you have any metrics in place to show how the work you're doing in the platform is connected to the features that are actually being released or the value that's being released? Do you know that your work is prioritized correctly or is it just being prioritized according to whoever is shouting loudest? These are all questions that really we need to understand. And one more question to consider, which I hear a lot, is how do we get people to use the platform? If you build a platform and no one uses it, is it really a platform? How much shadow IT is going on in your organization? How much money is being wasted within your business? If you've got what you think is the most amazing platform that is all singing, all dancing, but then no one's using it and they're going around it. How many teams in your organization are maybe circumventing policies and potentially putting the organization at risk if they're not following certain requirements? If we can't get people to use the platform, it doesn't matter how good it is or how secure it is or how compliant it is if no one's actually using it. So just to recap some of the ins and the outs, we've covered that an internal platform needs to offer a self-service interface to users and it needs to be able to drive flow of value across the business to customers. That's why we really want one. It enables DevOps at scale so that both platform teams and application teams are developing and operating like their own products themselves. And we know that we need to be able to understand kind of the internal context. We need to understand why we're building it, what it needs to, what needs it needs to fill, and looking externally, wider than just our platform team. We need to understand who the users are, because we're not just building it for ourselves. We need to have a way to measure that our platform is doing what folks need it to do. And we need to make sure that the platform is actually being used or else what's the point? 
So this is where we get to the best bit. Platform as a product and how it can help. Now, I've personally played around quite a lot with defining what platform as a product actually means. Um, I've attempted a few different definitions, but here's my latest one. So let's try this one. Platform as a product is what happens when you apply a product mindset to your internal platform. Okay, again, I'm not sure if that's a hot take or not, but I put a little flame just in case. Uh, so what does that really mean? Well, what I've tried to do is apply a product mindset to the questions I've just posed and see how that might impact some of the answers. So let's have a look. If we go back to the question of what is a platform, in Evan Botch's definition, he also mentioned that the platform needs to be compelling, which I've highlighted here. So in this way, it's like any other product that you might be offering externally. You need your customers to want to use the platform. So it needs to be compelling. You can't just, I mean, you could. You could have a mandate from on high that says, you all teams, you all need to use the platform. But the risk with that, if the platform isn't really meeting user needs or is awful to use, people are always going to find ways around it. They will go into a kind of a shadow IT. They will find a way of doing something that's faster or quicker or easier. And it's not compelling for them to use your platform. It's not a product that they want to use. And so they won't. So we're trying to apply the product mindset to our platform and make it compelling because people therefore want to use it. We mentioned earlier that within your platform team, you need dev and ops skills because your platform team is going to be developing and operating your platform. But if we're thinking like a product team, we, and we know we need to make our product compelling, there's probably some other roles that we need. It might be a good idea to have a platform product manager. In fact, it might be a very good idea to have one of those because they can cover so many different things. A product manager can help define the product strategy. They can help set out a product roadmap. They can manage the backlog of the features that are being delivered and, and, and help prioritize those features with kind of data-driven decisions and validating assumptions. They can really apply kind of the, the skills of product management to your internal platform. And you might also want to consider adding a designer to the team. If you're practicing as an organization, if you're practicing user-centered design for your external products, why not do the same to your internal product? Why not have a designer in the team who can help with areas like user research and focusing on that kind of user experience? So applying a product mindset to the, to the question of who should be in the platform team could look at expanding your team. Or even if you don't want to bring these, these roles in permanently, maybe consider rotating some folks in and, or upskilling some people in the current team to kind of grow these skills. This expanded platform team can also, or this expanded kind of skill set within your team can help answer the question on where to start. If the platform team is working like potentially other product teams in your organization, then they could be following a very agile process of kind of the build, measure, learn. The platform team could also be following similar engineering practices. So that could be extreme programming, test-driven development, other things. But the kind of the, the where to start with the, with the product mindset, your platform team will be focused on this build, measure, learn loop, understanding where to kind of where to start with the build and then building some and then measuring and learning that like fast feedback, that iterative process, being able to kind of like build and learn as they go so that they're always building the right thing and not building something for a long extended period of time and then finding out later that it doesn't meet requirements. And treating your platform as a product can also impact some of those external questions we looked at before. Who's going to use the platform? One area where having a product mindset can help is to take a more holistic view of the platform. A platform product manager can help 
in one sand, like measure, they can help kind of manage those external stakeholders. So teams such as security or compliance or governance, the product manager can help uh, like liaise with those stakeholders, understand their requirements, bring them in. It's also worth considering rotating some folks into your team. If you're very focused on kind of a DevSecOps approach, you might expand your platform team to have someone from security in the team, or at least have a rotation process where you can understand that your platform team is meeting requirements of the wider organization, not solely the, the application team. And it might be that things like security and compliance are actual gaps that your application teams are asking for. They might want to make sure that someone else is thinking about those concerns so they don't have to. Therefore, if you as a platform team have this holistic approach and are able to incorporate some of these areas in, you're helping the application teams and they will want to use your platform instead of having to think about some of those things themselves. On the question of how do you know that your platform is meeting needs, this is where user research is really critical. Having a designer in your team who can help facilitate user research is, is really critical to kind of make sure that we're doing it right. You might want to try a journey mapping exercise where you sit with a, with a team and you understand what are the steps that they're going through to get their idea or their code into production. It will help you to understand what the bottlenecks are, where you as a platform team can help reduce some of those bottlenecks and you know, increase that flow of value. You might consider doing some usability testing or surveys from your application teams to understand you know, what their pain points are, what their challenges are, learn as you go. An interesting experiment could be to go and actually sit with a user of your platform and watch them using it. You might get some surprises when you see how people are actually trying to use the platform that you've built. In team topologies, they make reference to ongoing lightweight collaboration which is also important, right? Your platform is not a project. It's not build it once and it's done. It's a product, it's long lived. It needs to continuously meet needs. So you need to keep an ear to the ground. You need to be able to make sure that your platform continues to meet needs and make sure that it's incorporating new feature requests, that it's incorporating new technology, that it's not getting too bloated and that you can trim things down. It needs to be able to kind of be long lived and stay relevant and solving problems for your teams. And last but not least, how do we get people using it? This is quite a big one. So if your platform is a compelling product, we shouldn't, as we mentioned, we shouldn't have to decree on high that folks must use this platform. They should want to use it. And if it's, really being treated as a product, there's probably a couple of key areas to focus on. If you think about when you're building an external product, you've probably got within your organization a marketing team whose focus is on marketing that product to the public, right? So if we think about how we're trying to market our internal platform, we should try to apply maybe some of those same techniques. So that could include things like doing branding, giving your platform a cool name and a logo, and then like marketing it within your organization so that people are curious about what's that, what's that thing I've heard about? And they want to try out this new platform. That could look like doing lunch and learns to educate teams about how to use it. It could look like producing swag. So you might want to give out stickers or t-shirts or mugs. I mean, who doesn't love swag, right? Give out some things to internal teams to get them excited about using your platform. Depending on the scale of your organization, you might have a developer advocate team who is going out and talking to users of your software or your product and like advertising it to them and also gathering their feedback. So why not do the same with your internal product? Do you have within your platform team a platform advocate? Someone who can go out and talk to your users of your platform, who can get them excited, who can gather their feedback, who can go and demo it, who can you know sit and watch people using it. Like that kind of external advocacy role 
that you might have with your products, external products, why not have it with your internal product? The other thing to think about is user experience. So we hear a lot about developer experience. This is where the platform team can really help, right? The platform, if the platform has a really good developer experience, then people will want to use it. Uh, I've talked in the past about golden paths. You might have heard this term. I think it's come, there's a great article by Spotify about kind of building golden paths. Uh, and there's some talks also at PlatformCon about it. But really, what we're trying to do is make the experience of using the platform delightful and make it easy, make it easy for the application teams to use your platform so that they know if they do that they are supported, right? So we talk about golden paths, about making the kind of the path to production simple and supported so that it has all the things that the, that the application teams don't need to worry about and will therefore reduce cognitive load. So I gave a talk actually at PlatformCon about cognitive load, but it's really about trying to ensure that the path to production is easy for developers. So that could include security and compliance and uh, any kind of regulations that have to be met. When the team, when an application team is deploying something on the platform, if they're following the golden path that you as a platform team have set up, then the application teams don't need to worry about a whole bunch of stuff, right? It reduces their cognitive load. They don't have so many things to think about. All they have to understand is that there's a fast way to be able to use the platform to get code live, and then it will be supported because the platform team is kind of recommending this approach. And the last thing just to think about, as well as kind of this golden path, is like that developer experience. So is it fun using your platform? I mentioned before about sitting with someone and watching them use it. Uh, I've sometimes used the term eating our own dog food or drinking our own champagne. I don't know, something similar to that. But like you, you want people to enjoy using your platform. And one real way to do it is either go watch someone using it or try using it yourself and understand some of the things that are a bit clunky or the things that take the time or the pain points. We want our platform to be delightful. We want people to not even worry about it or think about it. They just want to go ahead and use it. So we really need to be selling our platform internally and making sure that the people who are using it see the benefit. They understand the benefit, they get the benefit, and they don't feel pain by using it. So to summarize, I started the other way around. I started talking about the ins and then the outs and then platform as a product, but I'd actually like to invert the order. I think when we're thinking about platform as a product, that's where we should start. We should start by thinking about your internal platform as a product, like any other product. We need to apply that product mindset to the platform and that will help address these other questions. So we start by thinking about it as a product, we then look at the kind of the external requirements. Who's going to use it? What does it need to have? What does the platform need to have? How are you going to make sure it continues to meet the needs? How will you make sure people are using it? How are you going to drive the adoption? And then that leads you to the internal questions, like what's the tools that we're going to use? Who are the team that are going to build it? What skills do they need, do they need to have? Do we have product management? Do we have design, user experience? And we need to invest in that team because that team is really a, a driver of value for the organization. So it shouldn't be an, an afterthought or some kind of, you know, we'll just put some people together and they'll just get on with it. It needs to be invested in that skill set, that mindset we need to invest and that will help drive value across the business. Thank you for listening. Sorry if my voice is a bit croaky. I've been a bit coming down with a bit of a cold today but thank you for listening and no hopefully we have some time for some questions yes we have uh, 15 minutes for questions guys um, to remind you how you can ask your question you can use either a chat 
or a Q&A section or like ask the question in the Slack channel, channel after. But uh, to start with, I see that Tom uh, has a question over here. Uh, would you not rather say that DevOps is a culture, SRE is a position focusing on uptime of an application while a platform engineer also a position focuses more on how the application is published, both being part of the DevOps culture? I cannot hear you, Paula. I, I'm sure that. Sorry. No worries. I was muted because I was coughing. Uh, that's a great question, quite a long one. What I, what I understood is uh, is there a difference between kind of DevOps as a culture versus SRE and platform engineering more like a role? Um, which is a great question, actually. So, 100% agree that DevOps is much more about a, a culture. Um, it's not just about, I mean, <laughs> You probably come across the same where you, you hear about people who have DevOps as a job title and it's not really that it's more about kind of how things should be done. I think the same thing really about platform engineering, like platform engineer as a job title. But where I think the culture aspect comes in is this platform as a product in the same way that you can be a DevOps engineer but that doesn't really mean anything unless you're doing kind of the, the practices of DevOps around kind of automation and measurement and collaboration, like all the things that are part of DevOps. I think the same is true for platform engineering in some respects. You can be a platform engineer, so you sit in a platform engineering team and that's your job title. But for me, platform as a product is that cultural aspect. So platform as a product is not just having a platform team, it's all the product management practices that go with it. So I think that they're, they're, they're kind of similar in that respect. Like I say, DevOps is a, is a culture, but you can have a DevOps team, even if you're not doing some of the cultural practices. Same with platform as a product. You can have the platform engineering team, but the real benefit you get from platform and platform team is if you're doing platform as a product, at least in my view. <laughs> It sounds perfect. Uh, next question from uh, Solomon. Okay. So Solomon is uh, starting his career in uh, entry level developer, and he is curious at what level uh, he can start applying for jobs. And um, like one more question to add from my side to make this uh, you know question per se more spicy. What's the best <laughs> advice you received <laughs> when you were starting off your career? Oh, wow. Uh, okay, so the first question was kind of what, what level to start at? Can you repeat the first question? Yeah, uh, what level, I guess, like what skills um, he should acquire in order like to start applying for jobs? Wow, <laughs> that feels quite big. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I would say it really is going to depend on um, where you're at right now. Uh, for me, if you want to be with part of a platform, team, depending where you are right now in your in your current role, maybe you're you're a developer, maybe you're in testing, maybe you're QA, like like wherever you are, kind of in an organization right now. If platform engineering sounds interesting and you want to kind of move into it, like I say, it's quite broad in my opinion. Like so, there's there's the development skills of being able to kind of like write something if something doesn't exist if you need a tool if you need some code you need to, be able to kind of do some development if you are really more focused on the ops side then that's a great skill set to have but being broad as well I think platform engineering is quite broad as well as deep so things like understanding some of the different cloud providers if you are working in an organization that's using a, a cloud provider or having some background in infrastructure or networking it's kind of like for me platform engineering is quite broad so any skills that you've got but particularly if you're somebody that's in a role of user research or design or product management, all of those skill sets are fantastic. So if you don't have some of those skill sets, but you're interested, there's loads of there's loads of kind of online courses available, lots of reading material available. Uh, I think we're in an age. I mean, <laughs> your question about the advice I got. I mean, I'm quite old, so I feel like I I started. <laughs> not old, come on. <laughs> I started quite a long time ago. Uh, I mean, there was the internet, but it, it's, it's, it's one of those things where information is so available these days, so much more available. I feel like it, when I started out, you still had to 
do a lot of qualifications or a lot of like buying expensive courses and buying expensive textbooks. And it was harder to get information. I think these days it's, there's, there's probably more available and communities like the platform engineering one's great as well, because there's, there's so many experts you can just reach out to and ask for questions. So I think being curious is the best advice I've ever gotten. And it's what I would pass on. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Next question. And we have a bunch of those. So get oh, ready. Crikey. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. And next question is uh, talk to us about build, build versus buy a platform. Ooh. Which one would you choose? I think that's a whole other angle, right? Like, where you start, <laughs> like how much it time is. does it take? And uh, yeah, decision. I process. love that. I love the build versus buy. I feel like I could talk about that forever. Uh, build versus buy. So I like to think about, um, in some respects, I like to think about kind of wardly mapping or like understanding about what's your, what's your core competency as a business and what is not a value add, right? So if you're a food delivery service like uber eats let's say then your core competency is about having like the best user experience for that application about getting your food delivered fast having your drivers available all that jazz right it's not about doing kind of infrastructure management or building a platform there's like there's like certain parts where it doesn't make sense to focus your engineering effort because it's not your special source it's not the thing that makes you different or more valuable or better than the competitors so you should try to look at all the parts of your kind of platform or your tooling that you're using and think about maybe 80 percent of what you're doing you can buy right it's really funny because i've had this i've had this argument with people over the years about when you work with lots of engineers there's a real mindset of i'll just build that I'll just build it. It won't take me long. It will just take me a few minutes. I can knock that up really fast. I can do it over the weekend. I can just build that thing. That's never... The like home as well, you know? Yes. Like... <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But like people just think they could just build it and that's great. And maybe that solves the problem, but actually ongoing maintenance, day two is always a thing. And then when that person leaves and the half your company is running on this particular piece of code that they've written and no one else can touch it because they don't understand it, that's not ideal. So... I think it's about, for me, it's always about that choice of it. You might think you can build it, but if it's not really special to you and you can get 99% of what you need, if you just buy someone else's thing, some other SaaS product or some other like infrastructure tool, then build what makes, build what makes you special, add the value that's actually unique to you, but just buy the rest, just buy the rest. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, when you have a rather small team and two project managers uh, on it, do you think that it's going to cause issues, like too many cooks in the kitchen, or uh, they can, you know, <laughs> from the project manager everything? <laughs> I think, I mean, it's a question of, is it project manager or product manager? Because that's two different things. Um, yeah. The question states project managers. Yeah, I mean, I could confess, once upon a time, I was a project manager, uh, and I did my Prince2 certification. It's a thing that, uh, I don't know, it's a qualification I did many years ago, and I used to run a team of project managers um, in a former life. I So I have great respect for project managers, let's put it that way, because I used to be one. Uh, is it too many cooks in the kitchen? Mm, it depends. It's, it's important. <laughs> It's kind of impossible to say. I think there's a real, the thing that's really important to understand is the difference between project management and product management. Some of the skills are overlapping, but project management to me is kind of the thing I used to love about it is you do a project, you plan it start to finish. I mean, I used to love kind of Microsoft project and my Gantt chart and I knew exactly what was going to happen. And but like I used to, like I say, <laughs> I used to love that kind of stuff. But um Project management tends to be you're managing a project and it has a start and an end and you plan it and you have the dependencies and it's done. Product management isn't that. Product management is kind of ongoing and you're trying to like build and maintain a product going forward. So 
a platform team really needs a product manager. What I've seen a lot of is project managers coming in to install a new platform tool Mm -hmm. and they plan it, they install it, it's done and they're on to the next thing, leaving the kind of platform team, assuming that there is a platform team, leaving them struggling to then maintain the platform and keep it up to date with what users need and that that product mindset. It's interesting. You kind of need to have a different mindset, uh, essentially like product mindset to build the platform versus like project manager mindset, you know, to keep the project uh, going in. Like uh, it would be interesting maybe to compare it uh, somewhere in the future in some uh, talk uh, or something. But uh, next, next question is um, platforming um, and internal software seems a luxury, but long term strateg- strategically it makes sense. Uh, how do you bridge the cost analysis to convince decision maker? Can you repeat the first part of the question? I didn't hear that. Yeah, uh, platforming uh, and internal software seems a luxury. So essentially, like building out a platform, uh, ah, okay, so costs a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, 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 fair. I mean, it's a question of scale. I think I kind of alluded to that at the start of the talk, right? So if you are relatively small organization and you're kind of trying to deliver one or two products to customers and your team is kind of managing all the things themselves whether it's a whether it's an external kind of cloud vendor whatever you're running I mean the thing with platform is everyone's got one you're either building it or you're using it but you've got a platform somewhere because you're running your software somewhere um But if you're small, I'd agree that there's not much benefit to forming a new team that's the platform team and kind of really investing in it. If if you're able to kind of deliver with your couple of teams and the teams are running themselves, like doing the full DevOps, then fine. But as you start to scale, you, you find that actually you might be wasting money That's the thing. You might be wasting money with duplication if you've got multiple teams all doing their own, like Kubernetes management, for example, all spinning up their own clusters, all doing their own kind of figuring out like load balancing, whatever. Like it's where you start, where where you're trying to uh, convince people of that return on investment is really trying to look at, well, how much duplication can you save? How much waste can you save by centralizing some services? Can you actually save money and enable the teams to go faster, thereby getting features out to customers faster, thereby making the business more money? And I agree it's a hard sell because it looks like it's just cost, right? Because your platform team isn't directly tied to sales, right? The platform team costs money and they don't necessarily bring in money. But I think one way to try to tie them together is really, like I say, looking at what costs you can save, but also looking at how, if you could do a, I talked about journey mapping. If you could do a journey mapping, say, if we bring in this platform, we can get code out to customers five times faster, 10 times faster, then the business can start to understand or stakeholders can start to understand that actually it's going to make more money. And hopefully that can, kind of prove out that return on investment. Yeah, totally, totally makes sense. Uh, thank you, Paula, for that. And um, this one seems to be a bit tech- technical. Let me know if uh, you don't want to answer it, but since it's already there, is critics comparable to backstage different? <laughs> <laughs> It's really funny. So Kratix, uh, I mentioned at the start, is our, I've got the t-shirt, is our um, open source framework that we've been working on at Sintasso. It's come from, basically, the, the founding team are all kind of ex-Pivotal, ex-VMware, who have been working in platform for quite a long time. Like I say, not everyone's quite as old as me, but quite a long time we've been working in the platform space. And what we've tried to do is apply lessons that we learned so from building Cloud Foundry, which was a platform as a service, uh, which has evolved into kind of Tanzu application platform, what, uh, what we've learned is that um, for one thing, everyone wants a bit of Kubernetes. So uh, we are trying to use kind of Kubernetes constructs to, to build upon. And also 
the real thing we've learned, the real lesson is that um, you mentioned build versus buy. We've tried for a long time to offer a platform that met everyone's needs. And it turns out that that's not really possible because everyone's got their special source. Everyone's got that extra thing that they're trying to do, their edge case, their reason for, for being. And having one platform trying to meet all needs isn't, isn't quite it. So what we're trying to help with Cratics is we're trying to make sure that we can, like I say, building on top of Kubernetes, take the power of Kubernetes and make it like kind of the composable, flexible nature of Kubernetes, but actually allow people to um, compose what they need and actually try to meet those user needs. And we do, <laughs> we get compared to quite a few things right now. So on our, um, on our website, you'll see, I think there's probably a, a a frequently asked questions section about, or there's like, I think there's a Cratics versus section. So there'll be a, how does Cratics compare to cross, uh, to cross plane? How does it compare to backstage? How does it compare to Terraform? There's quite some information uh, available. So it's not, the <laughs> it's certainly not the first time we've been asked about how it compares to backstage. Um, but we like to think about with Cratics, really what we're trying to do is work really well with some of those technologies. So you could, deploy backstage using Cratics. And if you want to go and have a look at how, I'd go and have a look at the website. But Kratics, backstage is one of those things you could deploy with Cratics. So it's cross-plane, so is Jenkins. I know you can deploy lots of stuff using Cratics to build the platform that you need. Yes, cool. Um, just guys to remind everyone, uh, we uh, have nine more minutes uh, to go with questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> If you have any questions like further, like please go to Slack Engineering um, channel and Depot will get those answered for you. I'll also like copy and paste the, uh, the questions we don't have to answer. Uh, we don't have time to answer before this webinar um, ends. Um, so you'll, you'll be able to find the answers uh, over there. But uh, to continue with questions, the next one is what kind of metrics do you use to measure the success of your platform? I cannot hear you again. <laughs> uh, sorry, I keep drinking water because my throat is very sore. Um, that's a great question. So once upon a time in a previous role, we had a, a thing that we called kind of the Plat what do we call it? Platform health matrix. Uh, I've seen various versions of this, to be honest. Um, and there's lots of different measures you can have, right? So, um, I mean, the Dora metrics are quite nice, like time to recovery, um, th those types of things. Or like, um, I've seen measures about, I don't know, how many people are using your platform, uh, or how fast it is to deploy. I mentioned about like doing the journey mapping, like how fast it is to get from kind of like idea to production. I think measuring is really, <laughs> measuring is really important. Uh, you can't improve something if you aren't measuring it, because how do you know if you've improved it, right? So it's one of the kind of the, the DevOps uh, principles is like measurement is really really important I think in the, when it comes to platform you really need to think about what's important for your business like it's very hard like I say you could google online there's probably lots of kind of uh, maturity matrices or uh, platform health checks like I mentioned but I think as a as an organization, I hate saying it depends, but it depends. It's probably really, it's very context specific for you. Like what does, what do you care about? And if you haven't already been measuring, then start, like set yourself a baseline. If right now your average time to respond to a JIRA ticket is two weeks, I don't know. Like, like I say, it depends what you care about, but like pick a thing that you care about and measure it. Then think about how you want to improve it try out some of those kind of hypotheses about things to do to improve it and then measure it again and then track the improvement. Like that's how build, measure, learn really works, right? You need to think about what you want to measure and then measure it and then improve it and then measure it again and then learn and then go around the circle. Never stop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Until you die. <laughs> exactly. That's how it goes. Cool. 
Well, uh, last question since uh, we still have, um, you know, five, five, six minutes. Uh, so it's a little bit lengthy, but uh, I feel Okay, like... I'll concentrate. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please concentrate. <laughs> So uh, Miko says that I work as a part uh, of a system team for um, our responsibility has been tightly um, tied to releasing um, and operations, but now our team is sort of developing uh, to kind of uh, middleware between application teams and teams who develop platforms. I feel uh, that we do a lot of work making the platform more like a product to the developer teams. So basically, I've been wondering, uh, should we develop our team more to the direction of a platform team, or should we just think of ourselves ourselves as an enabler team? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it sounds like maybe that person has read team topologies, because that's kind of the two of the team names within the book, right? So um, platform team is as kind of I've covered, like the team managing those platform concerns, enabling team can be <laughs> a team that enables. I mean, I'm thinking specifically, like it could be, it could have some of the functions that that person's just describing, right? Um, and it doesn't really matter. Like the key thing about team topologies is about having a clear set of team responsibilities and a clear API kind of between the teams and an understanding between the teams of kind of who's doing what, clear boundaries, clear responsibilities, and a fast flow of information across the teams. So whilst it's good to have these kind of recommended practices, within the context for the person that just asked, it's it doesn't have to be set in stone. And I guess what I'm trying to say is like, it's hard for me to say you should do this and you shouldn't do that because I don't know the wider context, but there probably isn't a specific answer that someone external can come and say, what you need to do is just, just define it. It doesn't really matter if the, if the responsibilities aren't traditional or, you know, as perfectly prescribed by somebody else, your context might mean that your team wants to be enabling that team that maybe is more like um, kind of a cloud adoption team or a developer advocate team, but internal. It, it's, it's really just about making sure that there are clear roles defined and clear responsibilities defined and that everybody knows how, who's doing what. And if your team is veering into a certain direction, fantastic, like explore it, see what benefits you're offering to kind of users of the platform and then maybe share the experience, right? Talk about it. I don't think there's one, one way that has to work. I think it's just about having a good flow and team boundaries and then understanding who's doing what. Yeah, as long as other teams uh, know what you're doing, that's all good, yeah. you're aligned. <laughs> exactly, about understanding what they need and you're serving a team or teams and maybe another team serving you like that. That's kind of how organizations work, right? But just making sure that that definition is clear and that there's no friction or like difficulty navigating who's doing what. Yeah, um, I totally agree with that. But uh, we are on time. Unfortunately, I would spend another half an hour <laughs> with you, Paula. But I uh, hope to meet you in person soon in Detroit and October. Yeah. Uh, great. Guys, uh, send us a note as well if uh, we'll be in um, Cubicon let's meet, meet up in person we are going to host a party please join in um, and uh, we're going to send a follow up for this uh, webinar with the webinar replay and for two other questions that were not asked uh, during the live session I'm going to post them in our Slack channel so please okay. uh, go in and um, Paula is going I'll have to a go <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll remind you and uh, it was a pleasure truly and thank you so much for your time Paula I um, hope you have a great end of your day thank you thank you for having me I hope you don't have too many more earthquakes uh, I hope to but <laughs> Denver is crazy and they had like those like three big earthquake on the same day which is really more crazy on the 19th of September so guys don't go to Mexico on 19th of September <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.